in the interest of time, I think probably what we'll do with the rest of the session um, is uh, we'll go with the cases and then we'll use the cases to frame discussion. Um, so uh, the audience, please feel put free to put your comments and uh, questions in the chat. So we'll be keeping an eye, Ellie and myself will be keeping an eye on those. Um, and then we'll use the these cases to um, get chat from the, the other presenters as well. And um, so, uh, Graham, you look like, are you ready to go? Or is um, Zahir, did you, you, you're good to go, are you? Okay, um, so it um, gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Graham Stewart um, from Bristol Heart Institute. Um, he's a paediatric cardiologist and a sports cardiologist um, who is going to show us some cases. Right, I hope Thanks, I'm screen I hope I'm screen sharing. Am I screen sharing at present or not uh, yet? You're, I'm seeing you. Uh, I don't see your slides. Is anyone else seeing um, the slides? Ellie? Is... Uh, now I, I am now, yeah. So yeah, put your, please audience, put your comments, questions um, in the chat um, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on those. But thank you. Thanks, thank Graham. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I've put a couple of cases on here. What I'll do is I'll stop after the first case uh, and then Zahir, I think, has got one case as well. And then we can see if there is time at the end. I suspect there won't be. We can present uh, the third case. <clears throat> so this is the, the MDT, the multidisciplinary team meeting. Um, and my slides are not moving on. Just one second. Yeah, I don't know. I suspect I'm one of the few people in the audience who can remember Dr. Finlay's casebook. This is Dr. Finlay's casebook. Dr. Finlay was a Scottish doctor uh, and this was a, a, a sort of soap. It was the sort of neighbours of the day set in 1920s pre NHS GP practice. So this is something we may be coming back to in the fictional town of Tannock Bray. This is Dr. Finlay. He was young, he was dashing, he was headstrong and I guess he was probably Abbas. Um, this is his very efficient assistant, <coughs> Janet. Um, and OK, Ellie, I will call you uh, Janet. And this is the old guy. This is the reactionary, perhaps a bit past it guy. And I guess that's uh, Zahir and myself, because we'll be presenting some cases as we've seen them and get everybody's input on them. So this is the first case. <coughs> this is a, a true case, young man <laughs> presented at the age of 11. Uh, he'd been on a walking holiday in Ecuador with his parents. They were just about to go diving in the Galapagos Islands and he developed altitude sickness. <coughs> he was found to have a heart murmur. He had no symptoms whatsoever. Um, and then he was referred to the paediatric cardiologists. Uh, I have a paediatric and an uh, adult practice and he was referred to one of my colleagues who diagnosed a small ASD and what was described as mild mitral regurgitation. He also had first degree heart block. And I hope for the initiated amongst you will be raising your awareness at this point. <coughs> he was followed up in paediatric cardiology and then wasn't nothing very much happened until he was referred to a sports cardiology clinic, uh, which I run, which um, at the age of 26, because he was keen in doing a bit more sport. By this stage, he was a research engineer in robotics um, a very bright young man. Uh, he did an episode of blurring and vision, uh, which was just, uh, put down to keratoconus. He had laser treatment. And in fact, he never had any more blurring of vision. He had no dizzy spells. He had no palpitations. He was healthy. And there's no family history of any of these conditions. <coughs> His exercise history at this point, this was um, when he was 26, he would be running 10 to 15 kilometers three times a week, seven to eight, nine mi minute mile pace, not world shattering, but, but fairly respectable. And I'll show you some of his data later. His echo at that time uh, showed good biventricular function. There was a small ASD with a bit of left to right flow across it, no right heart overload, no pulmonary hypertension, no real indication for, for treatment. So he was advised not to uh, scuba dive and very little else. <clears throat> he had an ECG and this was his ECG. And this is an interesting ECG. So the, the salient features and uh, I didn't think we'd have uh, facility really for um, 
interactive questions, but you'll see he's got partial right bundle branch block, common in atrial septal defects, common in entirely healthy young athletes as well. But he has strikingly long PR interval. Uh, this is first degree heart block, he is in, in sinus rhythm, he's got normal QT interval, but his PR interval was 320 milliseconds and in relative sinus bradycardia, uh, 45 beats per minute and this ECG 51 and another one. So what does Dr. Cameron or, uh, think about this? Well, is this safe? He's got really very long PR interval and he's doing quite a lot of exercise. And if so, how can I tell if it's safe? How do I know this is this chap isn't sitting with a problem waiting to happen? So whenever I see a patient, I could almost stop at that point. Whenever I see a patient, I do an exercise test. I have a very low threshold for exercise tests in any of my patients because most pathology and most symptoms occur when the heart is active. And at present, most of our tests are done when the heart is at relative rest. This was a good thing to do with him because he's, he's a runner. <clears throat> so we put him through the test I use. So that's an accelerated Bruce protocol. I've used it for 30 years now and basically very simple to do. All you do is do Bruce protocol, but in two minute stages. And that is enough to exhaust even the most highly trained athletes. So it's not quite a ramp test, but it's similar. So this was him at stage one. You see his first degree heart block and partial right bundle as before. This is at stage two and he's still got these um, long PR interval, but he's still in sinus rhythm. This is stage three and this is a bit more difficult to see where his P waves are. <coughs> nice regular rhythm. You can see that there are P waves in here just about, so it's probably one to one. And if you look, if you enlarge it, you can see, well, the look, that P wave looks quite different from that P wave, but um, it's it's pretty regular. So I think it's probably still a sinus P. <clears throat> and then by the time he got to stage six, and this is quite a significant exercise using the two minute protocol, he's having a few ventricular ectopics, but only a few, completely asymptomatic. And you can see them there. And there's the P waves. And then during recovery, he's in this rhythm where you can't really see P waves clearly, you've got this one there. And then as you go at 30 seconds, two minutes, three minutes and four minutes, you see that it goes from this to quite clearly, he gets a P wave in here. And this is him back to his sinus rhythm. There's a long, long PR interval. So he's probably in some sort of different atrial focus here and here, and then right back to his normal rhythm. But very stable, only occasionally topics. And we see that quite regularly in, in athletes. So then we did a 24 hour tape and here you see his rate profile and it's really not too bad. So it goes down at night uh, and up during the day as one would expect. He does a little bit of this. So here he's, uh, he's uh, got a non-conducted P wave here, but this is at five in the morning. So again, this is not something you'd be too worried about. We see that quite a lot. Uh, and then he has this sort of thing where he changes his P wave axis. Again, he's got relative bradycardia, but again, it's five in the morning. So this is not something you wouldn't write home about. In the absence of symptoms, you certainly wouldn't do anything about that. He did a, did a bit of a pause there, so he had a three second pause there. And there's quite good evidence um, that most people would say in an athlete with three second pauses or less, you wouldn't do anything about it, particularly at night. And he's very, very few ventricular ectopic beats. He had, I think a total of only about eight or nine ectopic beats throughout the whole recording. Six in fact. So at that point, I, I said to him, well, look, keep to your current level of exercise. It's, we've heard how good exercise is for you in terms of your general health, your cardiovascular health. <clears throat> Endurance exercise, once you start ramping it up, there are other problems which we've talked a little bit about and we'll probably talk more about. There's the increased vagal tone and perhaps even more important, there's the down regulation of the IKF channels. And so athletes get bradycardic and there's a, that, that happens to, in a varying degree to different athletes. And I think that probably depends largely on how func well functioning your IKF channels are. I told him to avoid stimulant drinks. Um, many people are uh, known to drink Red Bull and then particularly the rugby players, three cans of Red Bull, you beat the chest, you go out and then you wonder why you're going to atrial fibrillation. So avoid stimulant drinks. We know he's got slightly dodgy conduction. 
avoid excess alcohol for exactly the same reason. <coughs> we know that alcohol and energy drinks can increase the risk of arrhythmias. Don't run if you've got a virus, if you're otherwise unwell. And th this is advice I give almost everybody, including my regular patients when they're getting their exercise prescription. And I said, look, uh, to try to give them an idea, I, I did go through the FIT principle, but I narrowed it down. I, I focused it and said, look, just don't, you know, you're, you're doing 10, 15K, don't run a marathon. Don't push yourself hard. And so that was 2018. In 2019, he didn't run a marathon. He entered two half marathons. He knew he had to avoid the marathon distance, so he went on to a 72-kilometer ultra run. Uh, no marathons, though. Again, he was he was running reasonably well. It's not world shattering, but uh, 10k in 50 minutes is not bad. He was asymptomatic. Now working in an advanced robotics lab, and he decided to sign up for a half Ironman. For those of you that are not familiar with that, it's a 1.2 mile swim, 56 mile cycle and a 13 mile run. Quite a significant degree of exercise. <clears throat> Again, that leads to the question, well, is this safe? He's obviously ramping up his exercise. And how do I know if it's safe? How do, how do we, how can we advise this guy as to what's right? And I, I'm very much of the school of practice. I don't tell my patients what to do. I try and talk through with them the potential risks of what they, and benefits of what they might do. It's their decision, not mine. So at that stage, so I brought him back. We examined him. He's fully saturated. He's not right to shunting across the small ASD PFO. No murmurs. Good ventricular function. No chamber dilatation. Mild LVH, borderline the centimeter and one to thirteen millimeter septum. Normal TDI, normal strain imaging. Repeated his exercise test. Um, and much the same, really. So he's uh, more or less the same as his previous one. And this time he reached stage seven, which is really quite, you know, some professional athletes do not reach stage seven of the accelerated Bruce. Peak heart rate 187 per minute, no activity whatsoever, normal blood pressure response. So I said, well, look, just continue as at present. We'll see you in a couple of years. And then, of course, there's a pandemic. And so he emailed me and said he's been called up, whatever that meant, to race a 55 kilometre ski touring event at 5,000 metres. This brings in two additional features. It brings in cold and it also brings in altitude. And that does make a difference to your athletes. So when you're advising them as to what to do, you have to know where they're going to be doing it. So this is, the partial pressure option is going to be lower up there. Uh, and I'm leaving in five days, uh, Dr. Stewart. Um, is it OK to go? Uh, can I do this? Uh, it's the usual sort of last minute uh, check. Um, now he's working in an advanced drone research unit. I always find it interesting where my patients end up working. Um, he'd not been seen for two and a half years, so I wanted to ensure that I saw him and arranged a review. His uh, 55 kilometre ski touring event was cancelled because his, his partner was injured. But by this stage, he's now running 70k a week. He's swimming for three hours a week and he's doing a bit of cycling. He's got some knee problems. Nothing to find an examination. ECG, again, it's much the same. He's got this very long PR interval. He's got a bit of early repolarization, sinus rhythm, relative sinus bradycardia. Echo, well, let's show an echo. And there really wasn't a great deal to see in the echo. He's either not a particularly good echo window and in fact a couple of years earlier I'd done an MRI scan and all the MRI scan showed was a question about a little bit of hypertrabeculation um, at the LVA apex, not much else, reasonable function. Uh, and normal mitral inflow. His right heart wasn't dilated. Um, No significant ASD, we did a bubble contrast and he actually had right to left shunting on his bubble contrast. Good longitudinal shortening of the right and left ventricle, good LV function, ejection fraction on Simpsons was 67%, normal tissue doppers, etc. But mild LV hypertrabeculation. Again, if I don't know what to do, I'll exercise them, push them hard. So again, this is him at baseline, very long PR interval, early repolarization. 
this is uh, stage three. Uh, his sinus rhythm is increasing. He's doing quite well. This is up at stage five. Uh, and this is up at stage six. This time he's getting, he's no longer in his sinus rhythm. He's got this sort of junctional low atrial rhythm, difficult to see the P waves. He's got a single ventricular premature beat. And this is in recovery. And as he recovers, he does this sort of thing as you see a sinus beat starting to come through on the background of this sort of junctional type tachycardia. No symptoms whatsoever, felt absolutely fine, did a significant amount of exercise. So I'm not going to give you an answer here, um, but I'm going to give you a couple of questions. So he's a 31 year old now, so asymptomatic athlete, and he really is doing a lot of exercise. He's increasing his endurance sport. He's planning a full Ironman. He's never had a symptom. But clearly he's got an abnormal conduction system. He's got some AV node dysfunction. He has occasional drop beats. He's got mild structural abnormalities, a small PFO and ASD. He's got a little bit of increased LV trabeculation. That's always difficult to quantify, uh, certainly on echo and also on MRI. So back to my question, is this safe? And if so, how can I tell? And perhaps more important is what information is missing? And the key is, of course, in the title of this talk, because we have no idea what his genetic background is. And that's actually, in this case, critically important. Because it's the genome that often moderates the outcome in this particular condition. And I hope that some of you will be saying, well, he's, he's clearly he's got this autosomal dominant ASD, doesn't that have an association with something or other? And yes, it does. And increasingly, we're recognising that this gene, NKX 2.5, is important in the etiology of this particular combination of ASD and first degree heart block. NKX 2.5, a really important gene, is a so-called homeobox transcription factor. These are developmental control genes. They have, there's only a relatively small number in the genome. They've got very important interaction uh, with these variable protein domains and in the development and, and in the transcription and in the, the um, uh, action of other genes. Particularly, it's involved in atrioseptal and conduction tissue development. And the phenotypes include ASD, but include a number of other congenital abnormalities. Uh, sorry, ASD, VSD, coarctation, tricuspid, I put them down here. Also in idiopathic atrial fibrillation, also in cardiomyopathy. They can lead to progressive um, conduction disorders, heart block, and importantly, they can lead to sudden death. And we now have had three families in our ICC service where there's been association of, of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias with this gene. And the more you look, the more you find as we're learning more and more about the NKX 2.5 association with nasty arrhythmias and structural defects. And I'm going to just take you through this little education forum from a couple of years ago. It hasn't really had the um, uh, yield or, or the, the take up that it should have done. So what this was, this is a Danish study. So much good research coming out of Denmark these days. And what they did was they, they screened 39 proma, probands uh, for, with congenital heart disease for mutations in NKX 2.5. And they found this ASD and AV block. They looked at the literature. And what they found was that of 15% of that group, of 120 with familial ASD and conduction disturbance, died from sudden cardiac death. So there's a, a, a remarkably high sudden death risk if you've got this combination of familial ASD conduction disturbance. And their conclusion from this little study was that implantation of a defibrillator should be considered in those patients. And therein lies the problem in somebody who's asymptomatic, who's got this um, potential condition. I don't know his genetics yet. He's three times failed to turn up for his genetic testing. Uh, and we're, we're chasing him up for that. So what are the lessons from this case? Well, if you've got this combination of conduction disease, first degree heart block with ASD, particularly if there's a family history, you should be genetic testing. Sudden death can occur in this group. And you should be considering an, I, an ICD if there's an NKX 2.5 mutation. As I say, we've got several families now where we have just that. 
And then thirdly, how do we counsel patients with excessive exercise habits? I speak as somebody with an excessive exercise habit and it's very difficult because he is determined to keep going. And if I was to say, don't do it, he will just ignore me. Um, and finally, just to let you know that there's a, the, the North American Electrophysi Pediatric Electrophysiology Group, PACES, have started a multi-centre register for NKX 2.5 patients. Um, it's led by Peter Aziz in the Cleveland Clinic, and they're looking for people to join in. So that's the first case. OK, great. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. That's a really interesting case. Um, uh, it's making me slightly nervous, all the messages about not doing marathons because I'm meant to be doing one in two weeks time. So um, so thanks for that. Um, but I, I think now in the interest of time, we will. Um, are you able to stick around, um, Graham, uh, for Zahir's case? Um, thanks again, uh, Graham. And Zahir, uh, Yusuf, if I can uh, introduce my colleague Zahir Yusuf, um, who is Professor of Cardiology um, at the University of Hospital of Wales, works um, very closely um, with myself. Um, Zahir is also a sports cardiologist. He's the heart failure and devices lead in Cardiff um, and sets up the uh, inherited, the structural um, inherited uh, cardiac condition service in Cardiff. It must be what, 20, 25 years ago, I guess, Zahir. Um, so um, Zahir is a great case and um, I think if possible, if we can make it, you know, we'll we'll make it interactive and try and get comments from from the panel on some of the findings. Um, and I'd encourage also the attendees to put their comments or questions on the chat if possible. So Zahir, thanks and over to you, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Aras. Um, and Graham, thank you for a really great uh, talk and um, obviously the, um, the meeting organisers for asking me to talk today. Um, so I'm going to crack through this case. Um, it's quite a recent case um, and just a little bit of background um, because what I wanted to emphasize in this case is really some of the extreme pressure that we're under. Graham, you know, alluded to this, you know, his, 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 his patient emailed him five days before a major competition and decisions had to be made very, very quickly. Um, so the background to this case I'm going to present is that this is uh, the case of a, a very high profile overseas athlete um, and I'm on purpose going to try and keep it as anonymous as possible because there are confidentiality issues here. Uh, but he's of Afro-Caribbean origin and in about a year ago he was drafted into a UK squad uh, to take part in a tournament. It was almost like he was, he was um, you know, he was acting as a locum. So they, they brought him in just for this one particular tournament um, and as part of his assessment um, and participation he had to go through a cardiac assessment which included a questionnaire and ECG which was mandated by his uh, sports discipline. Um, so if you remember last year we were still under some COVID restrictions so um, he arrived um, in the UK but he had to prove that he'd had the COVID vaccine so he had that a month before he came here. Um, he had no COVID symptoms um, on, on arrival and um, when he arrived in the UK, he had to undergo a period of quarantine and self-isolation. So all this was adding to the angst that he was, he was under because he just basically wanted to get here and, um, and, and, and start playing, um, which is what, what he, was, he was trained to do. Um, but after all the quarantine and everything, he arrived um, in Cardiff the evening before the tournament was due to begin. And you know, as far as he was concerned, he was going to have a quick chat, an ECG, um, get the all clear, and then start playing in the tournament the next day. Um, so this was his history. Um, so he actually arrived. And I actually went and saw him um, at the um, at the club. Um, exactly. Sorry, Sorry we're not we're not seeing your slides. We're not seeing the slides. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not seeing. No, I can I can see the slides. Can um, other people see the slides? No. I can see your slide now saying family history. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, I can see that too. Um, I think okay, so what I've done. May need to, people may need to click on on the box which shows the slides. Yeah, separate box. Uh, so we're getting a lot of people on the chat saying that they can see them. So I think you're okay, Zahir. Okay, fine. Um, okay, so now I've um, done something to my screen and I can't see a thing at all actually. Um, how do I get past this thing in a second? 
So yeah, I think. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Right. Okay, so um, okay, fine. So so going back to the history now, um, this is a 25 year old male Afro Caribbean athlete, and when you sort of ask him about his cardiac symptoms, um, he did admit to central chest tightness on exertion. He's had this for about two years now. So every time he runs, he was getting this chest pain, uh, not all the time, but intermittently. He actually denied any breathlessness, palpitations or syncope, uh, but his coach actually interjected at this point and said, well, actually, do you know what? Um, I have noticed that you're getting fatigued quite easily um, and breathless on short sprints. Um, and his coach actually said to me um, on, on, on the side, he seems to bend over with his hands on, knee, on, uh, on his knees, breathing very heavily, um, very easily. Um, okay, so I parked that in the back of my mind. Uh, There's no past medical history of note. He was not a smoker. He only had social alcohol. Um, he was on no regular medications or, um, or supplements of any kind. Uh, so this was his family history. Um, so this is the this is the um, the, the, uh, the the black uh, box there is is the player. He had three brothers who were all alive and well. Um, he had a mother who was alive and well, um, and he had a father and two paternal uncles who died um, and, and 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 were no longer living. So I went into the history about the, these deaths. So his father um, said died in his early sixties, unexpectedly during elective back surgery. So he went in for back surgery. He was actually working as a hospital, um, sorry, a, a school janitor at the time. So it was actually, his father was actually quite an active chap. He had back pain. He went in for elective back surgery um, and, and actually um, died um, a, a day or so after his surgery. Um, didn't have a post-mortem. And when you asked the player what the cause of the death was, he said, well, I think it was bleeding and cardiac arrest. But it was definitely sudden and unexpected. So then you ask about the two bro uh, the paternal brothers. Um, and here, again, these were sudden and unexpected deaths. Um, both uncles were in their 50s. Um, and the player didn't have any details about these, uh, about these deaths. But what he did say is that these things happen from where I come, come from. And we don't really ask about this. Um, it's very sad, but you know, I just lost my two uncles. Um, okay, so now we go into the ECG. So um, I don't know if Graham or anyone's around if want to comment on this on this uh, mid twenty yeah. Afro Caribbean's ECG. So if I um, I'll come in there. Um, how about uh, Anil? Do you want to comment on this ECG? If you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, you can see that. Uh, Sinus rhythm with um, T wave inversion um, being the main abnormality here, which I would have considered as normal if extending up to V4, particularly because it's preceded by a convex ST segment. But this isn't the case with the lateral leads of V5 and V6, preceded by an isoelectric, if not depressed ST segment, and also in the inferior leads as well. I've also noted the T wave being upright in AVR, which again may be associated with a cardiomyopathic process. OK, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Th th thanks, Anil. Uh, yeah, so look, you know, this was at about 8.30 in the evening now, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the evening, the night before he was supposed to take part in this big tournament. Um, and the player could quite easily, you know, saw some sort of uh, unease on my, on, on my face. So um, he sort of looked at me and he said, is there a problem, doctor? And I said, well, actually, I'm not really too sh sure about this. I'm not happy about this. So he said, oh, um, is my ECG abnormal? I said, yeah. Um, he said, well, I had it tested last year um, and, um, you know, when I had my chest pains. Um, and I've got a copy of that here. Do you want to have a look at it? So I said, oh, yes, please. So quick as a flash, he actually had it on his phone ready to show me. Um, so this was the ECG uh, that he had done a year earlier. There we go. Okay, so would anyone else like to um, comment on that? It's actually very embarrassing that um, his ECG a year earlier was actually better quality than the one we were able to do in Cardiff and yeah. projects better. <laughs> so uh, no syncope, is that here? No syncope at all, no. But some sort of um, chest pain that we're not sure about and, and a family history, a significant yeah. family history. Um, 
My, Michael, would, are you going to let this guy compete in the event? He's he's got a tournament tomorrow, does he? He wants, yeah. Well, his his ECG is uh, very abnormal, irrespective of ethnicity. It's highly suspicious of cardiomyopathy, and immediately looking at this ECG, I'm thinking of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of the apical form. So I would like to do a transthoracic echocardiogram since you've got him in his office, and then uh, decide. Given okay. the situation, I mean, because obviously you're faced with a difficult dilemma here in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, the individuals that is having to compete tomorrow. Sure. Okay. So I completely agree with that, and um, you know, so I asked him, um, well, when the CCG was done, what was the outcome of this? And he said, well, I had an echo and it was normal. Um, and the cardiologist I, set, I saw said there were no significant findings, no restrictions, and I could continue. To, you know, I was given the all clear, so there's no follow up arranged. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm absolutely fine and good to play. Um, but uh, as Michael said, you know, we had the facilities to do an echocardiogram, so we did an echocardiogram. I really do hope this plays. Um, let's have a look. There we go. Oh. Uh, That's not playing, unfortunately. Um, OK, let me see if I can do something else. So while you're um, while you're trying to get that to play, the concentric LVH 14 millimeters, um, no systolic anterior motion of mitral valve, possibly mid cavity obstruction. Uh, any thoughts? There we go. Can you see that now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yep. I can see that. OK, brilliant. OK, so um, yeah, Abbas, you've seen these pictures. Would you, uh, do you want to make or do you, do you want to ask anyone else to comment on these pictures, these echo pictures? Uh, yeah, um, Anil, for this black athlete. So far, what you've seen, are you happy with? Anil or Nabil? Uh, Anil, Anil. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think um, I think uh, it looks like there, there is a concentric pictures are here. Do you mind just playing it again? Uh, th th there does look as though there's uh, concentric hypertrophy there. Um, maximum wall thickness at 14 millimeter. Uh, 14 right. millimeters uh, lies at the upper limit of what would be considered normal um, for a black athlete. But of course, it's part of the clinical jigsaw picture and, and with the aforeseen T wave inversion, um, I'd like certainly to have more detailed cardiac imaging um, before getting in further. But can we look at his apex in a bit more detail as well? Because I can see you've got more images. Yeah, so some more images here. Are, are, are these playing? Um, can you see uh, these no. pictures? No, 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 no. You can just see the parasternal long axis and M mode slide. Oh, you can still see that one. Okay, so let me go to uh, this one here. Um, can you see this one now? We can yes. see your short axis. Yeah, when that's playing. Yeah. Okay. Um, although it's gone now, is that here? Is it gone now? Okay. Hang on. Okay. You see that now? Yep. Yep. OK, so that's the short axis. That's, that's at the mitral valve level. Um, and this is at the um, capillary muscle level. We have an apical um, short axis. Yeah, we, so that's a shame, actually. No, we haven't. Uh, we didn't have an apical short axis view. Um, so these are the only short axis views we didn't we manage to get. Um, I have got some other pictures here. Let me, can, can you see these ones? These are, this is the four chamber view. And. Yeah, we can see those. Um, yeah. So. OK, and then. Um, I'll just play this next one as well. And then there's another um, sort of zoomed in version of the apex. If anyone's interested on the next slide.
it can be difficult to tell an echo. I just wonder how how the apex tapers. I mean, the, the, the thickness of the apex looks like almost like the same as the rest of, uh, as other levels, but it can be very difficult on, on echo, can't it? Is that Nabil? Yeah, sorry, I should have yeah. uh, put my hand up. Yeah, there. no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, I mean, so Nabil is commenting that um, perhaps the apex is suggesting that maybe the apex doesn't taper. Um, so normally the apex becomes thinner, the muscle becomes thinner as you get towards the apex. Um, so, um, yes, Zahir, any... Um, so, yeah, yeah so, so that was exactly what we were thinking, um, you know. Um, so I actually phoned Abbas up and I said, look, Abbas, um, I've got a really tricky case here. Um, so I actually stopped the, play, the player playing the next day. Um, and I said, look, Abbas, you know, would you mind getting an, uh, an MRI done and getting involved with this case as quickly as possible? Um, so Abbas kindly organised these MRI scans. Um, so Abbas, do you want to do you want to talk us through these? I can I can put the yeah. uh, images for you if you want. Yeah, on Nabil, do you want to keep keep going? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So so the only one that I can see moving is the. Well, actually, I can see all of them now, and and there is suspicion on on the. I mean, if you look at the four chamber, the very very tip of the apex looks thin enough, but the sort of segments leading up to it look hypertrophied compared to what the apex should look like, and certainly you get that impression on the the two chamber view. Um, and I'm just looking at the three the three chamber, and again. It'll be interesting to see how much what that measures. It's difficult because there is some trabeculation there, and certainly in the two chamber, there's the insertion of the papillary muscles, which may also be apically displaced. Um, looking at that two chamber view, at least, um, it'll be nice to see some short axis uh, images as well. Um, but, and Abil, it's, it's almost like you've read my report because that's exactly <laughs> what my feeling was that there was a, a lack of tapering um, towards the apex. Um, the papillary muscles are apically displaced, the insertion of papillary muscles, which is again something that you can see in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and there was a systolic um, obliteration uh, of the ca apical cavity. OK, Zahir, back to you, please. OK, yeah, so um, so there was one one more um, MRI image. There we go. Uh, so this is the first pass in the late gadolinium. Um, I mean, you and I can tell that there's no white bits there. Um, so there was no evidence of fibrosis, and Abbas actually reported this and said, "No, there is. Uh, there was no um, fibrosis." So we're now two days into the tournament. Um, you know, everyone's getting hot under their collars, wanting to know what's going on. So I thought, right, it's time to make a decision now um, because there was quite a lot of stress going on. So I just sort of went, in, you know, through my head, I went through uh, where we were. In his history, the things that were bothering me was that he had a two year history of exertional chest pains and easy fatigability. Um, I was worried about his family history of sudden, um, three sudden unexpected deaths. His ECG, as we've all discussed, you know, is, um, is grossly abnormal, but had previously been passed as a normal variant. Um, we've reviewed his echo um, and, you know, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, maximal wall thickness 14 millimetres, displaced papillary muscles. Um, you know, for me, the normal left atrial size was actually quite important because with any form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you'd expect to see a, a, a dilated left atrium. It would be nice to see a, a dilated left atrium, but you can see that in athletes as well. Normal LV size would be more in keeping with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than, a, than an athletic heart. Um, and his cardiac MRI, Nabil um, asked about the maximal wall thickness. So I think when um, Abbas measured it, it was 12 millimetres at the septum, tapering down to about 10 millimetres um, at, at the apex. Um, and Abbas commented on the uh, displaced papillary muscle attachments and also some uh, apical cavity obliteration. And there were certainly no features of, of myocarditis. So that was my sort of resume of the case. And the question was now, what do we do? So the options um, were, OK, number one, we've got no definite diagnostic markers, so we can either accept these anomalies or concerns as non-significant variants um, and allow him to train and play with either no or, or routine restrictions. The second option was to accept uncertainty of the diagnosis, sit down, inform the player and the club um, that would obviously have some potentially some career implications. 
um, and arrange further evaluation. So I would have been very keen to get details of his family deaths. Um, you know, if his father went in for orthopedic surgery, he may have had an ECG as well. Um, as, um, as you know, Graham likes exercise tests. I love my exercise tests as well. So I would definitely have wanted to do an exercise test or a CPX test. Um, cardiac monitoring, perhaps even including a loop recorder for him. Um, and definitely long term close surveillance um, with the option of uh, genetic testing as well. And then we would have had to have a discussion about his risk of sudden death. And, you know, Mike's uh, just given a really good talk on that. Um, if you put his data into the ESC calculator, it is of low risk overall. But I think it would have been important to explain to the player that the risk is not negligible, but also not quantifiable um, on current data. Um, and then it would be a sort of a, a joint decision um, you know, involving the player and his family and his coaches and his clubs about whether or not he should play, be allowed to play and train with full resuscitation facilities on standby. And, you know, they could, could have had a discussion about an implantable defibrillator as well. So taking away the need for um, uh, defibrillators on standby. Well, the third option would have been to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy outright and say, no, this is definite hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, inform the player, uh, the career implications, evaluation, uh, the risk of sudden death again. And then, you know, once we've made a full diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then we would absolutely have to uh, start screening his three brothers as well. So that's what was going on in my mind at the time. Um, and so I arranged a meeting with uh, with family. Abbas, I don't know whether whether I, I if, before I go on to where what we actually did. If anyone wants to say any comments, well, I mean there are lots of comments in the chat. Um, everyone agreeing needs a treadmill test, hold to monitor. Um, some would want a CT coronary angiogram. Um, and there is comment, you know, that um, some are saying shouldn't be able to compete some are saying it's about a discussion with the um club and the player um uh, we've only got a couple of minutes so um okay, nabil okay. nabil wants to come in nabil do you just want to come in there quickly yeah i, I was just going to say that this is not an infrequent um situation that we come across um and i think apical hcm can be very difficult it produces some very nasty looking ECE changes but with very little hypertrophy um, nevertheless, the risk of sudden death is not zero. Uh, it's at the moment he doesn't meet classical diagnostic criteria, but this 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 person likely has apical HCM. And I think all we can do in this situation is explain this to him that his um, findings are highly suspicious. And the reason that we worry about this with sports is because there is an association, albeit small, with uh, HCM and sudden death. Uh, and you know, if the patient and the club are aware of this and they can make an informed decision, I think the final decision is theirs, um, not up to us to say, you know, you know, this is we don't know the absolute risk. I, I know of a premiership football player who had apical HCM and went throughout his club playing in a premiership club without any um, events at all. So we just don't know. Um, what the event rate is. It's likely to be very low, but you know, he should be aware that there is a risk and that risk is not zero. Thanks, Nabil. So yeah, what did you do? So, yeah, so I um, I arranged to meet up um, with the player um, and I, I went down the accept the uncertainty of diagnosis route. Um, so I actually met up with the player um, and we, we zoomed his family and his club doctor, his, his parent um, club doctor in as well. It was all on a Zoom uh, thing. It was all recorded as well for governance reasons. Um, and I explained to him exactly what Nabil just said. Um, so uh, Nabil, you must have a sort of direct line to, or telepathy to Cardiff actually, <laughs> um, because you've just taken the words out of both of us in my, my, my mouths. But um, yeah, we had that discussion with the player. Um, I talked to the UK club and they decided not to include the player in the tournament. So at that point, they hadn't made any contractual arrangements with the player. Uh, the one thing that we were asked to do is, is, is keep this out of the media. So there was no media coverage of this at all. Um, the player returned to his parent country the next day. Um, I actually gave him all his medical notes, the ECGs um, and all the imaging to the player as well. Um, he went back to his parent country um, and he went and saw someone there 
um, and he's got now got a, a letter that says he's fit to play. So he, he's, he's gone back to playing um, and I've kept an eye on him. He's had multiple achievements. He's in the media quite regularly and he's won lots and lots of trophies. So that's where we are at the moment. Right. Well, uh, thanks, Sahir. It's a fascinating case and um, you know, lots of comment on the chat. Um, some people talking about genetic testing. Um, there is some uh, uncertainty on the chat about how useful it would be, the risk of, um, uh, you know, variants of un uncertain significance, unknown significance, and which would take us nice, nicely into the afternoon session. But I think your case really nicely highlights um, the difficulty here, you know, in these cases, phenotyping the patient, working out what's going on, and the fact that we use a multifaceted approach, ECG, family history, history, um, symptoms, treadmill, halter, um, and sometimes it, it is just difficult and we have to be pragmatic and discuss with the, the patient and the club and the family. Um, so I'm going to draw that to a close here. Um, Zahir, thank you um, so much for that case and Graham as well. And thanks to uh, all of our speakers, Anil, Michael, um, Nabil. Thanks for um, sticking here till the end. Um, and I think it's been really, really good session. So thanks again for everything. Um, we'll draw it to a close. Can you please um, come back. It's a very short break, only about five minutes, um, about 10 past three for the afternoon or second half of the afternoon, which is um, genetics. Um, so just gives you time to grab yourself another coffee and pop to the loot and we'll see you back shortly um, at 10 past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.